This morning, America's first news starts right after this. Great news. There's a quick way you could save money. Switch to GEICO. GEICO could help you get great coverage at a great price, and it only takes 15 minutes to see if you could save 15% or more on car insurance. Go to GEICO.com today and see how much you could save. From Compass Media Networks, this is America's First News. This morning, with your host, Gordon Deal. Coronavirus surges. Good morning, I'm Gordon Deal, along with Jennifer Koshenka. It is Friday, March 6th. Glad you could be with us. Here's what we have for you this hour. Four new states are reporting coronavirus infections with a death toll in the U.S. now at 12. Meanwhile, Congress approved billions in emergency funding. On the campaign trail, Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren is out of the presidential race. She has not yet endorsed anyone. Gary Jones, former president of the United Auto Workers, is being accused of conspiring with other union officials to embezzle more than a million dollars. And how the U.S health system is ill-prepared for a coronavirus pandemic. By and large, the system isn't really ready for uh, a sweeping mass pandemic uh, um, along the scale of, of historic pandemics like there was a 1957 flu outbreak that was, you know, pretty devastating. Chris Rowland at the Washington Post on the serious gaps in the system like lack of hospital beds to quarantine and treat infected patients. At least four new states are reporting coronavirus infections, just as Congress approved more than $8 billion to fight to the disease. The death toll rose to 12 in the U.S., with the latest fatality recorded in King County, Washington, where six people have died in an outbreak at a nursing home north of Seattle. Also, a helicopter flew testing kits to a cruise liner idled off the coast of California. The ship remains barred from docking in San Francisco. Mary Ellen Carroll is director of San Francisco's Department of Emergency Management. A total of 35 have shown flu-like symptoms during the course of this 15-day cruise. Many of those people have recovered and are no longer showing flu-like symptoms. At least 57 new cases of coronavirus were confirmed nationwide yesterday, including in Colorado, Maryland, Tennessee and Texas, as well as the city of San Francisco. 20 new cases were confirmed in King County, Washington, which has the greatest concentration of coronavirus cases in the country. More punishment for stocks thanks to uncertainty about the coronavirus. The Dow Industrials lost 970 points, or 3.6 percent. The S&P 500 gave up 3.4 percent, while the Nasdaq surrendered 3.1 The number of canceled conferences and travel has continued to rise as more people have fallen ill, potentially hurting business activity and spending while confusing the outlook for global growth. Art Hogan is with the investment bank National Securities. The logic to that is you can't replace those flights that don't happen. So as you look at the whole first quarter and all the flights that have been canceled and the seats that won't be sold, and the, and the lack of travel that's happening generally, the airlines get hit the hardest. Investors and analysts have slashed their outlooks for corporate profits, and many have worried the virus will harm consumer sentiment and business investment. The Dow Jones Transportation Average, by the way, which tracks the performance of 20 large airlines, truckers, railroads, and shippers, dropped 5.3% yesterday, its biggest one-day percentage decline since September of 2011. Here's an angle of the coronavirus you definitely don't want to hear. The growing outbreak in the U.S. is revealing serious gaps in the health system's ability to respond to a major epidemic, forcing hospitals and doctors to improvise emergency plans daily, even as they remain uncertain how bad the crisis will get. More from Christopher Rowland, reporter at The Washington Post. Chris, what have you found? What we found was that, by and large, the system isn't really ready for uh, a sweeping mass pandemic uh, um, along the scale of of historic pandemics. Like, there was a 1957 flu outbreak that was, um, you know, pretty devastating and that, you know, would put a huge strain on uh, our system. So we've probably heard a lot already about the lack of, you know, protective gear for healthcare workers, you know, that includes masks and uh, sterile gowns and things like that. But what we found also was that, you know, hospitals are uh, going to be strained pretty heavily uh, by uh, 
an outbreak that's massive because they don't have uh, sufficient numbers of ventilators. Uh, they don't have uh, sufficient numbers of isolation rooms for patients. And now these problems become especially acute in rural areas where there's just not uh, the kind of infrastructure that you would need. So then if, if coronavirus spreads to those types of places, to rural areas, you know, the interstates are just vectors for disease. Ultimately, depending on how bad it gets, um, this could go everywhere uh, over a matter of years. And um, patients who are severely affected in rural areas will have to be transported uh, to, uh, you know, suburban areas. So then you're talking about what happens with, you know, ambulances and ambulance workers and disinfection and all that stuff. Have you come across any good news while looking into this? The good news is that there's a lot of really smart people who are improvising on the fly on how to address and confront these problems. Okay. Um, I talked to a number of hospital officials and doctors who are, you know, literally every day uh, sitting around their boardroom tables brainstorming on uh, scenarios and what they're going to do if things get worse. Um, and so, they, you know, already in places they're developing ways to keep patients from coming into the emergency room, for example. So, you know, people who are uh, only are showing mild, mild symptoms and need tests in Rhode Island, uh, they are uh, being checked in their cars outside in the parking lot by yes. health workers who go outside in protective gear. Uh, they put masks on everybody in the car. They do swabs uh, and take uh, samples, and then those samples get sent to the State Department of Health in Rhode Island. And so that's how they're kind of triaging this situation to try to minimize the impact both on their ER but also, you know, minimize the spread. So if, you know, try to keep that virus contained in that family. We're speaking with Chris Rowland. Business of Healthcare reporter at the Washington Post. His piece is called U.S. Health System is Showing Why It's Not Ready for a Coronavirus Pandemic. Well, there's just like a litany of, felt like it could have been bullet points in your story about things that have gone wrong. One of the things that stood out to me, too, is we talk about things like a shortage of medical masks, for example. You said uh, budget conscious health systems do not maintain large volumes of reserve supplies just for the possibility of a pandemic. How come? Well, I mean, you know, the uh, money is in short supply in the healthcare system, uh, and especially for hospitals, which uh, tend to have, especially nonprofit hospitals, have very, you know, margins of maybe 3%. Especially community hospitals have margins of, like, you know, 1% or negative percent. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, if there's these small nonprofit rural hospitals, community hospitals, and they just can't, it just doesn't make sense for them to have, you know, a reserve of, you know, five ventilators and a couple of ICU rooms that they might need, uh, you know, in the event that there's going to be an outbreak. You know, right now, if they're seeing people who need that type of stuff, these people uh, get transported to, you know, urban centers. Um, but uh, in, a, in a pandemic where people throughout communities, hundreds or if not thousands of people throughout community are being affected, you know, the, the medicals, academic medical centers are going to fill up. And so these community hospitals are going to have to fill the void, but they are ill-equipped to handle large numbers of people with acute respiratory distress. Thanks, Chris. Chris Rowland, reporter at The Washington Post. It's 14 minutes now after the hour on This Morning, America's First News. Let me tell you about my new favorite way to pass the time while commuting. It's the app called Blinkist. Blinkist works on your phone, your tablet, or your web browser. Blinkist takes the need-to-know information from thousands of nonfiction books and whittles it down to just 15 minutes. Successful people like business leaders are well-known for reading self-improvement books. I just finished listening to Snowball, a Warren Buffett biography. Listen to Blinkist while commuting or maybe exercising, even while you're waiting for your kids to finish practice. Blinkist has the latest titles from bestseller lists as well as the classic nonfiction titles you always meant to read. I also like listening to some of the history titles, since I never had much good history in school. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash morning to try it free for seven days and save 25% off your new subscription. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T. Blinkist.com slash morning to start your free seven-day trial. You'll also save 25%, but only when you sign up at Blinkist.com. Slash morning. Hey, welcome into Friday. And then there were two. The top tier of the Democratic presidential primary race now features just Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders. The last struggling candidate to drop from the race 
Since Super Tuesday is Senator Elizabeth Warren, whose poor showings included her inability to even win her home state of Massachusetts. I was told when I first got into this, there are two lanes. And I thought it was possible that that wasn't the case, that there was more room and more room to run another kind of campaign. But evidently that wasn't the case. She has not said at this point who she'll endorse. Public surveys indicate her supporters could split between Mr. Biden and Mr. Sanders. Meanwhile, Mr. Sanders told reporters yesterday that he had a positive talk with Ms. Warren and said there was no question that her platform is more ideologically similar to his policies than former Vice President Joe Biden's campaign. The first time the two frontrunners go head-to-head, by the way, is this coming Tuesday when six more states hold primaries. 20 minutes after the hour on This Morning, America's First News. Here's Jennifer Koshenka. And now, the three big things you need to know. Number one. World health officials say countries are not taking the coronavirus crisis seriously enough as outbreaks surge across Europe and in the U.S., where medical workers are sounding warnings over a disturbing lack of hospital preparedness. Number two. Global markets tumbled again over concerns about the impact on the economy and as countries take more drastic steps to prevent contagion of a disease that has killed more than 3,300 people and infected nearly 100,000 in 85 nations. The Dow Industrials tumbled 969 yesterday. National Securities Market Strategist Art Hogan. If you look at the airline index, that's declined 5% or more for five of the last nine days. This kind of selling is extremely rare. It's, it, it's analogous to the kind of selling we saw at the banks back in uh, November of 2008. Number three. A Birmingham man was executed last night on a 2005 conviction of being an accomplice in the murder of three police officers. 43-year-old Nathaniel Woods was put to death amid a storm of appeals and protests from supporters who noted that Woods did not kill the officers. And the trigger man, also on death row, said Woods was not involved. Elsewhere, a federal judge has accused Attorney General William Barr of a lack of candor and questioned his credibility in the handling of the release of Special Counsel Robert Mueller's report last year. The judge, who was appointed by President George W. Bush, has said there may be reason to believe that Barr, in summarizing the report weeks before a redacted version was released to the public, intended to create a one-sided narrative about the Mueller report, a narrative that is clearly in some respects at odds with the redacted version of the Mueller report. His decision opens the door to additional parts of the report being unredacted and made public. And it's now up to the players. The NFL Players Association has sent ballots to members for voting on a proposed collective bargaining agreement, giving the union a week to either ensure another 11 years of labor peace or send the matter back to the drawing board. The distribution took place two weeks after league owners voted in favor of a 17-game regular season and a change to the playoffs, among other things. Man, 11 years of (laughs) no labor issues could be... could be a little thorny. Yeah. Thank you, Jen. 22 minutes after the hour on this morning, America's first news. Thanks for spending time with us. U.S. stocks have lost trillions in market value since last Wednesday's close amid concern that the coronavirus outbreak will further damage an already slowing global economy. If you're worried about your retirement savings and just can't stomach the stock market's wild swings, portfolio managers have some advice. Jessica Menton, personal finance and markets reporter at USA Today, has been sampling their opinions. Jess, what do you have? A lot of investors were obviously rattled since stocks have lost trillions in market value over the past couple of weeks amid this coronavirus outbreak, since there's a lot of uncertainty of what it could do to economic growth moving forward, especially when it comes to the global economy. So I've talked to a lot of different portfolio managers, and they've all driven home the same advice, and it's to really stay the course and remain calm. And so you really have to ask yourself, if when it comes to your investments, if how long term you're going for, because it should be for the long term horizon. But if you feel like you can't really stomach the losses that we've seen over the past couple of weeks, it could be time that you might need to adjust your allocations and develop a new plan for yourself so that you can have a better long term goal and withstand different outside events when different unknowns come up like the virus. So that's something important. And just to remember that we're going to remain calm and not be over emotional and making sort of adjustments because you could still miss out on gains if you do that. Yeah. What's today's rule of thumb? Is it if you're five years from retirement, don't sweat it. If you're 10 years from retirement, just ride it out. What, what is it? 
That's a great question because even if you're 65, if you plan on living until you're 95, that's still another 30 years that you need to be invested for. So when it comes to the you know old rule of 60-40, that's kind of fallen out of favor just because if you look at the bond market and the type of...